Hello, and welcome to another live Geotech Hour. I'm your host, Dr. David Bray, inaugural director of the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center, and we're here today to talk about countering bot swarms, mass false accounts, deep fakes, particularly the intersection of geopolitics and the technologies associated with this. And this is part one of a two-part series. The second part will be airing on April the 28th, also live, and is actually a continuation of conversations we've been having here at the Atlantic Council, both with the Geotech Center, as well as our colleagues with the Digital Forensics Research Lab. We had most recently an event in which uh, several of the folks that are joining us today joined us in the conversation on February the 3rd, talking about tech-enabled dis- and misinformation, social platforms, and geopolitics. Today, we're actually going to be diving a little bit deeper into the tech, busting a few myths as to what we should and should not be concerned about, and really thinking about what we can do to address this, both in terms of technologies to counter misinformation, but also be aware that almost everything that we try and do as a solution, it's almost a game of predator and prey. There will be continuing evolutions in this space. So with that, I'd like to welcome, we have some really robust and exciting panelists. They are some of the uh, some of the best thinkers in this space, I would say. Uh, they also just happen to be um, senior fellows involved at the Atlantic Council. So I'm really excited to have, first and foremost, Alex. Alex, welcome to Geotech Hour. And I'd ask you with the opening question, uh, why do or should we care about bot swarms and false face account, uh, fake accounts? And why is this a concern, Alex? Great, thanks, David, and thanks everybody for um, showing up today. I think um, that question certainly is uh, has you know you can take it in many different directions, but I think the three main points to kind of consider: um, the world is hyperactively virtualized and data driven, and these things are highly vulnerable to um, you know to being manipulated. Um, so much so um, that uh, you know we we have a word called spoofing where the act of actually manipulating virtualized and data driven uh, uh, information systems um, it's an attack vector and i think it's a it's a very attractive and interesting um, concept that perpetrators of of ill will and um, uh, nefarious activity are going to um, they're going to exploit our information environment uh, more and more all the time. Um, it's a it's a highly hyperactive you know circumstance moving forward. And if this stuff's left unchecked, um, you know you're going to see. You're already seeing this all the time, but you know draw this out a few years and consider the extremely high degrees of intricate manufactured realities that could ensue. Uh, where you know for those that are familiar with the um, open uh, systems interconnectedness model, we view information technology on a stack. And if you can imagine where you think you're interacting with the world, um, be it transactions on Amazon or something like that, uh, the most intricate uh, and um, complex manufactured reality that uh, you know essentially has you sitting on a hypervisor that you didn't even know you were on um, is, is a world where you're convinced that you're interacting uh, with uh, things that you think you that you should trust when in fact. For some amount of time, um, you know, you've been interacting with something that is deliberately set up to take information from you. I'll uh, I'll leave it there. If you had any uh, any any questions for follow up there, sure. Uh, well, I really appreciate it, Alex, and I, I really liked your your phrase that intricate manufactured reality. I think that's actually an interesting premise to think about. And I often talk to people about just just pointing out, you know, how many of us know more people online than we know in real life and and how do you know for sure if they really are the people that you you are interacting with and things like that so so if i could ask you a real quick follow-on question because because i think you, you did a very good overview of, of this concern of, of this intricate manufactured realities this spoofing um is there anything from both either things you've seen or in particular concerns you have as you look to the future can you can you share something that makes it sort of tangible for our listeners in terms of what might be an actual like specific concern that you might have Sure, absolutely, and we're we're living it. Um, and I think what what someone should ask themselves. I mean, you you kind of alluded to it. Interacting with things that you didn't realize uh, that weren't human. Um, if you want an entertainment value, uh, you know, look at this. Consider deep fakes and what they are and what they've become and how convincing they are um, to send some kind of an interesting uh, you know communication or message to somebody to convince them of a certain reality. But you know, take a look at like. Um, bots that were propagating disinformation over just the last couple of years. Everybody's aware of the, the questions of the information environment where um, people ended up with interesting information from sources on the internet. They had no idea where they really came from. And in some cases, we've really been able to um, expand our viewpoint about 
you know, who was really in control of the narrative being passed over, you know, very uh, large scale networks of things of, of entities that didn't even really exist. Uh, so that's a it's a real world circumstance that kind of gives you like a close in viewpoint of the problem as it is today. I would just encourage you know the the listeners the, the thinkers in this space to draw that out and say it's bots today. But where the heck is all this stuff going in so many different directions? What how what will the flavors of this problem be like uh, left unchecked with all kinds of advanced technologies moving forward? Excellent. Well, thank you, Alex, and that really does set the scene well. And, and I now like to segue to. Uh, Longtime friend of the Geotech Center, and, and really what I would say, uh, SJ, if I could say you are the grand dom of, of modern efforts to try and address misinformation, disinformation online. And so with that, uh, be interested in your similar take on this. I mean, should we care about botnets? And, and what should we really be thinking about in terms of concerns in this space? Yes, care about botnets, but. So I'm, I'm your tame heretic for the day. <laughs> so I, you know, I started my work, um, recent work on 2016, 2017, looking at um, AI models of online human communications and how you embedded bots within that and how you adapted those those, those comps. Uh, I chased down big botnets um, in several places, but it's not 2016 anymore. You know, 2016, this was the big problem. Now, you know, we're getting, the platforms are kind of getting on top of those bots. Um, we have a problem with mass fake accounts still, um, but Mass networks of real accounts, I think, are where the trouble is at the moment. So you've got a shift in the problem from fake users to fake groups um, with real people built, pulled into them uh, and that feed and caring of those groups keep them growing. Uh, you've got fake news outlets. You've got copies of genuine news outlets. I mean, I'm seeing that in some of the countries I'm, I'm working in. But that idea, so Alex, I love when you, talk, you talked about trust because one thing is to look back at the intent of these things. So one intent is trust, another one is confusion, another one is, is volume. You're using volumes to confuse, to amplify, to freak the algorithms. But I, I think the platforms are starting to get on top. Um, a little slow sometimes, but you know, um, some of the takedowns take a while and, and you don't, not all bots are bad. So we've got to think again about that intent. So there, there were some bots that actively improve discourse that are, are going out looking for things like fractured points in communities um, that I wouldn't like to remove. Um, those mass fake accounts. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that transfers to a lot of places. Um, you know, I'm seeing it in, outside the US, uh, starting to see it in other platforms, starting to see other uses. Uh, bots. Fooling humans has been around a long time. Um, in Eliza, decades ago, Eliza was fooling humans that they were socially and interacting would keep them online. So I think they're still out there. There is still some volume, but not as much as it used to be. And, and like Alex, I think the worry is where is this shifting to? Where are the next vectors? Very well said. And, and if I could ask you, SJ, because I think you did a you did a good sort of timeline in terms of things that you've seen and things that you've been involved with, with the taking down botnets and things like that. Um, I know in past you've talked about this idea of a cyborg, this combination of human yeah. and, and bots. And maybe if you could explain that for our listeners, I'd be interested a little bit more there too. Oh, um, so I can't remember who actually coined the, the term for cyborg, but it, it's a nice one because what you'll have is an account that has a bot keeping it active. So you're, if you're looking at a uh, time graph of his activity, it's active most of the time, um, but low level active, and then humans come in and feed it. So you've got sort of retweets and all the rest of it going on to keep that account live, but then a human will come in, put in uh, a tweet, modify something, push it out. So it's not a bot that you could easily take down because there's a human too. So that, that, that's been around longer than we think. Yeah, I, I, I may have seen some of them in the past life too, yes. Uh, and it makes it hard because people are like, well, it's actually a human. It's like, it was a human for one one hundredth of the time and most of the time it was a bot, exactly. Yeah, I mean, at which point does it become a bot? Yes. And, and really, I think the focus, you have to focus on behaviors, you have to focus on intents instead. Because just focusing on is this a bot becomes interesting. 
Yes, very well said. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, SJ, again, and, and thank you for all the, all the positive work you're doing globally on this. And that leads us next to our, our another guest, uh, Pablo Brewer. You, you are also a longtime friend of the Geotech Center, also with the People Center and Internet Coalition. You've done a lot on this space, and I guess I would be interested in your take on this question, uh, both where have we been and where are we going when it comes to being concerned about bots or what's next to replace bots? Man, I got to tell you, it's hard having smart friends because they take all your speaking points before you get a chance to answer. So <laughs> let me let me just recap a little bit. So so historically, the bots have been you know relatively dumb, uh, and they were used specifically to amplify and to game the algorithms to make things trend. Uh, I, I think we need to be less concerned about those. I think the the social media companies have figured out by looking at cascade depth propagation and time based. Uh, cascades when something is being artificially pushed. Um, however, there are other things that you could do with slightly smarter bots. One of the things you could do is, is called dilution. When something is legitimately trending, what you can do is you can hijack the, the hashtag, if you will, to change the message or not let people get to the real message. And there was a fantastic instance of this uh, in the last few months that was not done by bots, but was done by legitimate people. Uh, and it was during the time of the insurrection and the LGBTQ plus community hijacked the Proud Boys hashtag. Um, and, and so that led to some really uh, kind of fantastic ways of, of diluting uh, hateful messages by, uh, by extremist groups. Uh, certainly you can do that uh, in a time window with things that you don't want people to find out about. So as legitimate news is trending, uh, certainly you could use amplification of bots to kind of hide the real information amongst a bunch of noise. Uh, and so it's not a long-term thing. It's definitely within a given time window. Uh, the other one is the, the one that SJ mentioned, which is the, the cyborgs. Um, one of the things that's uh, fun and yet challenging about the connected world is that we're able to go back and look at the history of things. Mm -hmm. So if somebody reaches out to you on a social media, let's pick Facebook just for the sake of argument, uh, and their account's only been around for six months, it, it looks a little hokey it, because there's there's nothing backstopping it. Uh, and so uh, the, the issue is that you you need to have these backstopped identities around for a long time so that there's a bit of a history. And that's where the androids come in, or, or I'm sorry, the cyborgs come in where periodically it gets posted by an automated bot. And then every so often you have a human being go in there uh, and, and post something. And so now you can have kind of this dormant account that looks legitimate for several years. And so now when it posts something, uh, it's a lot harder to uh, determine if it's a real person or if it's a, a fake account. Uh, the other part is uh, there, there's been a lot of hoopla and, and Gartner hype cycle stuff about uh, AI and GPT-3. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that computer scientists solve these unsolvable problems is by reducing the sample space. Uh, certainly, we've had AIs that have passed the Turing machine uh, test, but it is much easier to pass that if you're doing it in 144 character tweets. Right. Uh, and, and so by using smarter bots that are backed by AI, uh, you can actually generate far more real looking uh, and more targeted, not only uh, initial tweets, but responses and amplification. Very well said. And I look forward to when we can actually see predictive AI for what's the next memes that are going to be trending on social media. That would be, a, I imagine you could actually make a whole small fortune if you could do that, Pablo. And, and as a follow on question, if I could ask, um, so, so you talked about how, how you can actually use some of the tactics um, to actually try and, and, and take down bad behaviors. Uh, I think there was also a case that I heard that happened within the last year too, um, where unfortunately by feeding what were, what looked like um, illegitimate uh, postings, for example, um, I think it was, it, was a, it was a hashtag, someone had intentionally started a hashtag toothless socialism, and they had looked like they were very bot-like in terms of their postings on Twitter. And the trouble is when people tried to point them out and say, these are our bots and, and you know, these are clearly illegitimate accounts, it actually called attention to the very hashtag and it got it trending. So can you give us examples of where maybe sometimes well-intended behaviors by humans could actually end up feeding the trolls or feeding the bad, the bad behaviors that you're trying to actually stamp out? 
Yeah, absolutely. There's no such thing as bad publicity, right? That's, <laughs> and this is true in social media as well. So uh, if somebody posts something hateful and you're absolutely outraged by it and you forward it or you respond to it, well, that hashtag also increases in ranking and that subject also increases. So you're actually, you could be lending a lot more uh, light and attention to something that you are not happy with. Uh, so it's definitely a balance. Uh, this is not new. It's not unique to the internet. Uh, the only part that's unique to the internet is the breadth of reach that the average user has. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've got for some unknown reason about 2000 ish followers on Twitter. Uh, that's not a lot compared to some, but I, why 2000 people would listen to my mental rantings and ravings on Twitter is beyond me. Uh, but the fact that I, at a moment's notice, I can reach an audience of 2000 people uh, is uh, fairly troublesome. Uh, when you expand it out and you give everybody that kind of access. No, well, very well said. And I agree. I think it, it, you could almost imagine a scenario where you could get one group upset at the other group and then that group upset at the other group and then just step back and just watch them exchange volleys back and forth. And so what may have been initially something that was automated or, or at least intentionally designed to cause a shooting war, then you step back and you have an actual shooting war online that happens. So I think these are interesting challenges that we got to face forward. And, and I would just like to remind our listeners, if you have questions, feel free to ch chime in um, through social media or through the, uh, the Zoom room that we're hosting right now. And I'm now going to now pivot to the next question, which is, so what should we do about using um, these, these technologies for good, addressing them as challenges, uh, and then actually trying to figure out how we move forward? So for that, SJ, I'm going to go to you first and say, so, so what should we do about this? And, and recognize that it may not necessarily be entirely a technology challenge, but what would you recommend for technologists to think about in this space? Oh, well, there's the whole find them, fix them, fix the problem stuff. But the guys are going to cover that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking from the, the human side, I mean, we, we can help the platforms without um, putting the pressure on people who are subject to things. So to, to have to do the reporting, but basically report if you see something reported in. Uh, a lot of people kind of see stuff, get annoyed, don't actually tell the people who can do something about it. Um, ring fencing, uh, like those hashtags, um, teaching people to be cynical, so the usual stuff, but you no, know, thinking more like a hacker, you know, think about what the creators are actually doing with this. So why are they using botnets? What are they trying to do with them? And disrupt that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just learn from InfoSec as, as always. Uh, dilution, that, that dilution move that Pablo was talking about, that's, that's a honeypot by any other name. You can put honeypots up. Uh, you can add friction into the system. So things like putting small delays on posts to make it harder to keep repeating. Um, if the amplification is the thing you're, 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 you're disrupting. So yeah, systems, just think of it as a system and think about what you can do to slow them down. Um, targeting, uh, I, I can't talk about this every single time, but <laughs> the, um, the mass ignoring privacy on US networks. I mean, I love being back in Europe because I get asked if I want to share my data every time I go somewhere. Um, but giving up your privacy means you're easier to target, which means it's easier to segment you and add stuff at you. Um, so disrupting those parts, disrupting the whole system on the other side. The other thing is that this isn't an isolation. So disinformation thrives where people are seeking information. So, I mean, there's also, you know, there's seeking behavior, the sharing behavior, but thinking about Things like data voids, where those voids um, might be, you know, a URL-based void, a news-based void, hashtag subject areas, but where are people looking for information and not finding it that the, the bots are coming in and pushing up um, their version? Think about the spaces that you're working in. Um, I'm heartened over the last few years to see a lot more work in the narrative space. Mm -hmm. So instead of worrying about all these accounts plus all these messages. What are the narratives and can you one-on-one -on -one with those narratives? So we've seen some good work from people like Reality Team on counter narratives and pre-bunks. And again, you talked about thinking ahead. Pre-bunking is thinking ahead. It's it's thinking what the space you're actually acting is. There, there's some more radical stuff I've been thinking about for a while about uh, do you actually need to change the structure of the internet? Uh, the way social media works, the way people connect. 
to, to make this less of a problem. But I, I think the first two um, help the platforms. Um, the first three think like a hacker, disrupt what they're doing, uh, and improve the information system it's sitting inside is 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 where I go. Well said. Uh, appreciate it, SJ. And so now I'm going to pivot to Pablo and ask the same question. And, and maybe if you're interested, you can even try and take that that, that one torch that, that uh, SJ was passing on about how might we rethink the internet? Is there a need for, say, digital identity or other things that may actually address this? But I interested, I'd be interested in your thought as someone who is very well steeped in this technology here. Uh, no, thanks. I, I think we have to be careful when we start talking about things like digital identity, that we are not looking at it from a very Western-centric purview. Uh, and, and the challenge is, let, let's assume that uh, everybody in the West agreed that we were okay with digital identity. How's that going to play out for dissidents in China or Iran or the Uyghur population? Uh, we would certainly agree that uh, we're probably not very happy with China's policies on digital identity because it forces you to post as a real person. And so there's really no room for, for dissidents or, or contradicting thoughts or anything of the like. So we really have to be careful with that. Um, now, there are some cases where digital identity, uh, if it's voluntary, uh, it, it is actually a good thing. So if you're, uh, if you're a, a professional journalist, uh, if you're the Wall Street Journal, you should absolutely be able to digitally sign and watermark your media that you put out and go, no kidding, this is from the Wall Street Journal. And so if you've got a problem, you've got a problem with us as opposed to uh, Johnny's blog. Uh, now, if Johnny wants to post and sign with their blog, then good for them. But if somebody claims to be a professional journalist and is unwilling to sign, that conveys something about the trustworthiness of, of the source. Uh, certainly, like SJ mentioned, time delays are good. We've been using these for years and years on radio programs and on television. Uh, news uh, in India spreads very quickly via WhatsApp, so they instituted a time delay. Uh, it's a bit of a circuit breaker. It's not for everything, but once it reaches a critical mass, I, I think that's good. It kind of interrupts the, the emotional state and gives people a moment to breathe and think, and, and that's really what's required. Um, I think that one of the things that we could do is uh, label news versus editorials on the internet. Hmm. Um, and, and I'm gonna put this uh, flatly on professional journalists. I, I think if you listen to a lot of TV news or radio news, it's very hard to tell when they've gone from reporting the news to editorializing. It used to be very clear, now it's not. Now, uh, certainly a, a private citizen pro posting as a private citizen, the assumption is it's editorializing. But if you're posting as a professional politician or a professional journalist, you should certainly label those things because your title brings with it a certain authority. Uh, as SJ mentioned, uh, pre-bunking news from authoritative sources, right? Uh, you know, the if it's about elections, then I would expect the local elections committee or the state elections committee or the federal elections committee to tell me what my uh, mail-in ballot looks like. Tell me what protections are there. Uh, I should be able to know what my mail-in ballot looks like before it arrives in the mail. Um, the social media companies have done fairly well trying to identify uh, items that are either known to be misinformation or suspected to be misinformation, but pointing out that it's misinformation is not sufficient. What they should do as well is point to the authoritative source. It is misinformation. Here are other places you can go read about the ground truth. Uh, and I think that would help. Um, along with that goes a little bit of data provenance I already mentioned about digital watermarking for professional press corps. Uh, and the last two I'll say is the same AI models that are used on social media to present you content that you would like should also be used to go, wait, wait, you're way over on one side or the other of the Overton window. I'm now gonna present you things that you may not agree with so that you get a more balanced view. We could absolutely do that. It's just a matter of tweaking some variables. And the last one that I'll add in, and uh, this will make me unwelcome in the Bay Area for a very long time is, we have absolutely got to change the funding model for social media platforms. And the reason is that the funding model is to present ads. And in order to present ads, they have to drive engagement and people engage a lot more 
on an emotional level than they do on a cognitive level. Uh, and so they're very much disincentivized from actually solving this problem because it affects their bottom line. Uh, and so there's an inherent conflict there that must be addressed in some form or fashion. Well said, Pablo. And I, I'm almost thinking about how um, we know, for example, that social media triggers the same sort of neural state as like gambling, where you get, you know, get flashing lights, you get little symbols and everything like that. And, and ultimately, the casinos want you to, yes, come and play the tables, but not to become a, a, a like complete gambling and like to lose all your savings. And so maybe it's something where we can at least try to have the conversation and say, look, yes, you want people involved playing the tables, but you don't want everyone to become so addicted to gambling that they, they give up on everything else. So. Well, you know, um, I watched a, a great documentary. Uh, I'm not sure how balanced it was, but it was certainly uh, an educational documentary called uh, The Big Hack. And then the other one was called The Social Dilemma. And in the social dilemma, they pointed to a class that's taught at Stanford on how to make your digital product more addictive. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's a great marketing thing. I wonder if there's a required component that goes along with that, that's an ethical component about how do we do this and not do harm. And that wasn't covered in the documentary. Uh, if I were Stanford, I probably would answer that question very publicly <laughs> and take corrective courses, and I'm sure they're not the only one. Uh, that was just the one that was covered, but uh, certainly an ethical component to what could go wrong with my digital product or digital service. Uh, that, that should be a requirement for anybody going to school. Well said, and, and I think that also just underscores that again, what we're dealing with is at the end of the day, this is about altering, as Alex Wood said, it's, it's about your exquisite perceived reality, the manufactured reality that you're getting, and so, I think there is a responsibility of any company that is providing services that shape and inform your reality. Yes, maybe you're an entertainment company or yes, you're just a communications company, you're not a news company, but if what you're doing uh, gets people in a mental state that is so disconnected from reality or is so addictive, um, that's equivalent to you know selling cigarettes without warning labels or selling alcohol to a minor and things like that. So with that, Alex, okay, over to you on the technological questions as to what can we do here? <laughs> yeah, gosh, everybody covered such great points. And I, I want to circle back to one that um, Pablo was just speaking to, which is, you know, uh, and take it a step further, in fact, because like the we, we have to pay specific notice to the idea that these these problematic constructs that we're referring to, this, this discussion is about botnets and, and bots at scale, et cetera. You know, it isn't just, you know, hoodie wearing nefarious actors in basements that put these things together and, you know, built them on the dark web and whatnot. I mean, these are the, this is computer science meeting the market uh, initially, right? So if you look at like ad tech, adware, um, these were the kind of the proving grounds of the ability for the commercial market to try to emphasize its ability to put products out there. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded of Jeff Goldblum's quote from Jurassic Park, you know, I forget, you know, his, his chaos theory doctor, he was like, well, you thought about the how, but did, you know, did you ask the question why? Did you think about the why? And I think we have an awful lot of that we've never really investigated over the last few decades as the internet has blown up all around us, as we live our lives uh, ever more so this past year on online and whatnot. We are surrounded by things that can be certainly misused. And so what I, I think, yes, there are technological interventions. Um, yes, there are key questions that I think that we need to be asking uh, industry to consider so that we can try to uh, deliberately manage. I think as, as computer scientist Alan Kay, you know, has said uh, before, um, you know, you have to, uh, you know, to predict the future, you should invent it, right, essentially, right? And, and I think that is something that we, we should consider. But I, until you can get to that point to have the technical discussion, I also think there are many, many layers of other disciplines that don't traditionally get involved in this space that we're going to have to figure out how to bring them in. So from like, I think you alluded to it a minute ago, the the psyche and the, the human orientation to the information environment, especially as it's virtualized, you know, what are the effects at the biopsychology level when you're exposed to, uh, you know, to um, when you interact with the information environment as is today, and then walk that path all the way up to psychology, sociology, cultural studies, the intellectual level, in my mind, there's this, there's this great layered cake of all of these disciplines that uh, work in stovepipes, generally speaking. But what if we had a commission that could get together and try to make some sense of the, uh, of the why question of all this so that 
it could be in a an objective place to try to help shape uh well really how to regulate uh where the information space goes in the future right and to have an, an, an authoritative and objective stance on why we should or shouldn't allow certain kinds of technologies to persist uh, or you know uh or evolve i really like that perception and, and it actually ties to another question that we have alex that builds on what you asked um so from the audience uh greg johnson asked a question which is whether you're talking about um, immutable audit technologies, uh, I won't use the B word, but I, you know I'm referencing it there. But but the, 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 you know some people have claimed this is a solution. Um, is it a solution? Does it scale? I, I'd be interested in your take there. So, I, I think that is the question of the day. We we have uh, we've run off and done amazingly. I mean, this is like a actually a perfect question. We've done the most intimate thing we can with that technology, right? And uh, and considered it for, you know, replacement of currencies and stuff like that, right? So you're already, you're already in a deep relationship with it. Uh, so of course, you're going to ask questions, you know, what does this elixir do? Uh, and can I can I conquer any of my problems with it? Um, but I guess, you know, I, I have to insist that candidate technologies that could be considered in this space, uh, should be considered in this space, but need to wait so that we can get to the humanities, uh, you know, arguments and circumstances that underlie the, the technological problem. Is that is that kind of is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very fair, and I, I think you're right. It, it's 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 that we we may rush to a technological solution before we actually get to the belief systems and actually the, the fundamental human issues, which I think a friend um, uh, and colleague in, in in the audience was commenting on, which was um, was uh, Rand Wilson was commenting. So I'm now going to pivot to let's imagine a scenario. Uh, maybe it's hypothetical, maybe it's building up and we don't even know it. So we already know that there are things getting heated, say, in Russia. We know there are things that are getting heated up with uh, the South China Seas. Let's imagine six months from now, things are getting to the point where things are tense. Um, but in the efforts to try and do some diplomacy and things like that, even before the United States can take a step forward, um, let's say we're swarmed with misinformation about what the U.S. is or isn't doing in this space. Um, I would raise to all our panelists, what would you recommend for government entities that are trying to operate with authenticity when we're being swarmed with um, different comments and thoughts here? And, and so how can we operate as geopolitical actors on a world stage if, 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 if a less than truth can get halfway around the world than a truth can? Remember that pre-bunking. <laughs> get your truths out early. Um, make sure that you have them consistent, somewhere accessible, that they're in the spaces people are looking. It, it's, it's information gardening. You can't think about disinformation without thinking about the information as well. It, it's not mm -hmm. just like, take it away and you're good. That's a good way forward. And I really appreciate that, SJ. And, and, and OK, so, so how do we help a US public that is already uh, somewhat skeptical and polarized to deal with that? So, <laughs> Not to put you on the hot seat. If you figure this out, you could probably like get a Nobel Prize for peace here, but I'm just asking. So, Alex? Yeah, this is Irish saying, if you want to go here. Sorry. Yeah, this is Irish saying, if you want to go there, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, look look at the problem in its most kind of basic and, um, and frustratingly obvious circumstance, right? We were talking about, um, you know, I mean, how should I start this statement? I grew up watching Peter Jennings on ABC News he stuck to the news bulletins that were reported by the Associated Press. I, he was an authoritative figure on my television set, and the news was over and done inside of a half hour, right? And that was the news. I think Pablo might have been talking, or maybe SJ was talking earlier, the 24-hour news cycle driven by professionals whose lives it is to, you know, infuse a dead space with something. You have a membrane of opinion and unvetted information that is of course, it's going to be difficult, uh, especially if you have, you know, kind of the exuding authority of any figure that sits on these uh, talk shows, uh, be they a politician or a clergy person or whomever, right? You, as the viewer, you are very easily and deliberately confused, right? Um, because they really just need you to keep watching, right? And, and the more you think that you're getting authoritative information that's not uh, entertainment, then the more you're likely to, to stay tuned in. So I guess the point I'm making, you know, there are some good models out there that take an attempt to try to show, you know, uh, uh, media bias, right, and give you a sense of how they slant. 
Um, and we live in an, in an era right now where you could you just have a very hard time bringing people together to sit down and look at that chart and say, yeah, I agree. My, my news veers off in this direction over here, right? But you have the, the space is so flooded full of uh, variants of what used to just be, uh, you know, cable network news uh, uh, offerings, right? They're everywhere. They're all over the place. So, you know, you look at this whole conversation and you consider, what do I do about that space? How can I get people to kind of get off the sugar diet of, uh, you know, of entertainment infused information, if you will, and make some deliberate decisions to try to um, keep, a, keep a better diet about what they're consuming in the information space. I don't have any, I have been struggling to try to figure out what that looks like uh, in the space that I work in. Um, and I don't think there are any easy answers. I just think that it's, um, you know, we, we have to agree that we've got to keep working on, you know, how to, how to craft that messaging and do it in a way that attracts people to, uh, you know, to think critically without alienating them, right? Because that's the worst way to get into this conversation is to tell people that they're uh, bought into you know, uh, to um, to something that's incorrect, wrong, you know, pick your choice, right? We all have family, we have to deal with this kind of stuff all the time, but I'll-, I'll Oh, I, I like that idea that, that you pointed out that that if, 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 we have, if we have lost the trusted sources and gateways that may have had challenges or, or biases in the past, how can we regain them? And, and we know, for example, that, that Europe, uh, certain parts of Europe have been trying about trying to at least have local community leaders be there and actually move that forward. But I, I just raised that. But uh, Pablo, your take on it. I mean, imagine six months from now, South China Sea or Russian Ukraine's gone hot. Um, and so many things are flying. Uh, I get SJ says we should try and pre-bunk. Um, but it seems like sometimes the United States, there is just so many possibilities our geopolitical system can go that pre-bunking might be kind of clear. It would require clairvoyance in some respects. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say it requires clairvoyance. It does require a little bit of strategic thought and planning. Uh, certainly, we, we seem to be surprised that there are other agents out there that have competing narratives and competing goals. Uh, and we need to quit being surprised by that. We need to start thinking about what is it that we want to put out? How do we want to put it out? Uh, how might our message be counteracted? Uh, and And some of the other things are rather pedestrian but we've gotten away from them and i'm gonna i'm gonna put on my my engineering hat you know when i was in school and i was going through my my engineering classes it wasn't sufficient to have the right answer i was required to show my work so maybe one of the things that we can do is i, I understand that journalists have to protect sources but if they're making comments on a bill when i read that article there should be a link to the bill uh and maybe with a reference to the page number and paragraph um, it, it's not that hard. Then it's, uh, okay, I've now personally read what the bill says, and I either understand your interpretation, agree with it, or I don't un don't agree with your, but now I've read it myself. I've gone back to the, the ground truth material. So certainly we can do that. Um, we need to get the populace, get the audience used to going to authoritative sources. Um, certainly, we, uh, you know, we have different parts of the political spectrum, but we all know how elections are run. We know how they're supposed to be run. And so regardless of your opinion of whether an election was run well or not well, you should go, here is the authoritative document, the law on how it's supposed to be run. And here's why my opinion, and it should be labeled as such, or my interpretation is X. Um, I, I loved Alex's example of, uh, of Peter Jennings. I also grew up uh, watching ABC News and Peter Jennings. I had a slightly different uh, remembrance. Uh, it, the news was 30 minutes, and that was true. And it was 25 minutes of it were reporting the news, and then he would close out the segment with a labeled editorial. But it was labeled an editorial. Uh, and so you knew what was reporting and what was the anchor's opinion. Um, the last one comes from the age of print. I know print media is having a hard time, but it used to be the case that right after the front page were corrections and retractions to the previous issue. Hmm. The, the difference now is that uh, people don't go back and reread a story that they've already read. And so the retractions and corrections are down at the bottom of the story that you're not going to go back and read again. And so you're not made aware of that, what those 
corrections and retractions are. We have to be a lot more upfront about that. Uh, we need to uh, find a way so that we know that when somebody reads a story that there is a, a link right up front that says retractions and corrections and I can click on it and see what all of your retractions retraction uh, and corrections for the last month were. And that does two things. First of all, it allows me to make a better informed decision about whether or not I want to trust you as an authoritative source. Certainly, we all make uh, mistakes. Uh, I don't expect that's going to change anytime soon. Uh, but if we start seeing mistake after mistake after mistake, um, that lends something to your credibility. I, I think we need to bring a little bit of credibility back. Um, the other thing is, uh, I'm going to show my age here. Uh, I remember MTV coming online and showing music videos, and there's a meme running around, you know, MTV 1980 to 1984, uh, because right around then is when they quit showing music videos and they started showing shows instead and movies. Uh, I think some of these 24 hour news channels could learn from that. Uh, I think what you do is when you look at the programming of a lot of these 24 hour quote unquote news channels is, there's a lot more editorial commentary and there's very little news reporting. Maybe they should relabel themselves. <laughs> very well said. And, and I think it, it, it does raise a very interesting question, which is, you know, we, we recently have had in the United States and elsewhere, some very visible political figures make statements. And when later those statements were found to not be true and they were then the, those, those political figures were you know, in some cases they were pressed with, and it's, it's very hard in the United States, unlike, and I'd be interested in your take, uh, SJ, coming from the UK and Europe, Europe is a little bit easier to do defamation and prove that and slander, where in the United States it's a lot harder um, for different reasons. But, but, but when they have been pushed and said that this was either defamation or, or a political figure saying something that was clearly not true, uh, apparently the legal defense is anyone should have known that they were not saying that as an expert or they were not saying that as fact. And you're absolutely right. Do we need to almost have a little like green light, red light that when a public figure is speaking, all right, I'm now talking on the record as fact. And then this is just my, my opinion. It's almost like, do we need that little switch? But I, I, it's just something that's been kind of interesting that that seems to be the defense that, well, clearly you should, you know, at no point should you assume that me speaking as a public figure, this was me as an expert saying this was fact. This was clearly my opinion. I don't know, SJ, do you find that this is a perplexing thing about the United States or elsewhere too? Uh, I come from a very cynical island. Uh, we don't necessarily believe people just because they're up talking and popular. Mm -hmm. But also the, the US does have a bit of a big useful idiot problem. Um, <laughs> yes. It was very big microphones and not so much on the veracity. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how you're going to fix that. Um, we tend to kind of laugh and you know, ignore that, but it I guess some of it's segmenting. Uh, some of it is power bases. Some of those useful idiots are parts of monopolies. Mm -hmm. So that aren't the alternative voices. Uh, I'm thinking outside social media, I'm thinking about radio television, where, yeah, going back to my, I spent a year driving all over America listening to radio. I, I kept hearing the same narratives, the same voices everywhere. And that um, variety seems to be seems to have gone. Oh, um, useful idiots! Sorry, Pablo is. <laughs> yeah, we have you. a question. As to what is a useful idiot? <laughs> From the other panelist. Um, <laughs> so, if you're trying to push a narrative from outside, then quite often you will find somebody who is an influencer who will um, push that narrative for you, quite often unknowingly. So they don't actually know that, you know, they're pushing out a Russian narrative or they do and they don't care. But it's somebody within your own walls who, who is broadcasting misinformation, disinformation. And to put that in real, I mean, we know this actually has happened. There's been cases where actually journalists did not know and that was later revealed that they were actually, they had been approached and they were, you know, just aligned with their interests and their passions. It was just that a, actually a Russian operative had approached them to continue to post and then actually intentionally sort of polarize and charge the message. But that does raise the other question, SJ. Could you explain uh, what's a cutout? Uh, that may also apply here too. What's a cutout? <laughs> oh, sorry. I mean, I was going to say that that useful idiot thing is, is something that's been used by spies for forever. Yes. 
Go read Le Carre. Um, a cutout is you put uh, an organization or people or groups that give an air gap between um, yourself as an operative and the audience. So they don't actually see the person who is pushing the narratives, who is creating the content, is coming apparently from somebody else. So similar to useful idiots, but might not be you know, real. It might just be some of your extra accounts. Very well said. Thank you, SJ. And, and maybe now I'll actually pivot to Alex on this question, because there is a question from the audience, which is, um, are we seeing a, a loss of a large amount of credibility uh, from mainstream media over the last two decades or so? And, and I would ask that question in the context of, let's remember, say, the 1890s and the period of yellow journalism. So have we, have we lost a large amount of credibility? <clears throat> did, we, did we ever have it? Did we get it briefly? Be interested in your thoughts there from a historical lens. Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. And I think, uh, yes, you can draw some parallels from, you know, the muckraking days and sensationalism in the press and the telegraph, right, when we can actually when information found its way out of the bottle, uh, you know, just like we do with everything, humans turn it into a gun, you know, and use it for power and influence or whatever the case, right. Um, and, you know, I think there's an important distinction. Um, and I'll take up for a little bit of the news media because uh, they can be very frustrating, right? A couple of years ago, it, uh, it was remarkable to me that some uh, lesser known media outlets that were not news were being featured as sources so that one network could get the story out sooner, right? You could see them reacting to just the race condition aspect of trying to be first with the scoop. And I thought to myself, man, they are running with scissors because every time, you know, refutations come out later, um, the net result is that people don't trust uh, network news, uh, you know, PBS, NPR, whatever the case may be, right? Um, what I would say, uh, I feel like, this is just my opinion, I do feel like there are a handful of networks out there, particularly the national networks, uh, who are keeping, maintaining and grooming the scope of their offerings to the public, right? Um, and they really do um, an important amount of, um, of correcting the record uh, in very obvious ways in front of, you know, of their viewers. Pablo mentioned, you know, hiding retractions, you know, deep inside the newspaper where you're never going to see um, a, a search for the truth revealed to the public, right? That's an excellent, uh, you know, uh, example of how it's broken. But I think, you know, I think people should at least ask themselves if it's uh, important to them to try to want to have a relationship with the media so that they can get what they need uh, from a consistent source that's trying to provide in interesting or important news, right, to get a message out. Um, and then also be fair about trying to recognize when, uh, when the news media, when these outlets, and again, I'll, I'll emphasize national network news is, is, is trying, right? I'll, I'll even call out CBS because that's, that's typically what I, what I watch. It's, it, is, uh, it happens often where they deliberately want to be in your face telling you where they got a story wrong. Mm -hmm. that, that, that actually, I think that's an interesting way to restore credibility is to be authentic and say, look, we're human to air is human. Uh, this is, it's a complicated world and we're not always gonna be right, but we're trying to do the best interests. And so that actually, maybe the pendulum will shift back and we'll look back and then say, just like the 1890s for a crazy period of time, who knows? Who, who we may actually discover our new Pulitzer was already uh, operating in, in this current decade. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out. Um, so Pablo, question for you. Um, so I, I happen to have heard, can't necessarily confirm because I didn't see it, but I, I heard that in the in the presidential election um, process, there was a candidate in the early days that actually chose to wear a body cam from basically morning to night. So if they actually were hit with a misinformation or disinformation attack, they could just say, let's roll the footage. Are we getting to a point where we need our public leaders to have some way to actually like, let's just go back to the record? Um, you know, what would you, I mean, uh, how, you know, we, we already have the idea of like cameras for police officers. Do we need a similar thing for, um, for public figures? You know, I, I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Um, certainly everybody's familiar with the term deep fakes now. Uh, we've seen lots of uh, examples in the last year where legitimate 
news footage became altered and it, in a way that it didn't uh, didn't reflect the truth. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the one of Nancy Pelosi appearing drunk. Um, so that's a bit of a double-edged sword. But it, it, if I could circle back just a little bit to the question you asked, Alex, um, I don't think that the mainstream media has lost any more credibility than it had in the past. Uh, you can go back, as you said, 1890s yellow journalism. He, here are the things that have changed. Uh, a, a couple of things. The first one is, I, I pointed to it earlier, that we're not as explicit when we're pointing out editorials or commentaries as we are reporting the news. That's what number one. Uh, Number two, and Alex touched on this, the 24-hour news cycle means you've got to fill it with content. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that gets exacerbated by the fact that we just have too many choices now. And so no matter where you are on the political or financial spectrum, you can find a 24-hour news channel that speaks to you uh, and excludes everything else. So we end up self-radicalizing uh, because we're only getting the news that we agree with and we're only hearing opinions that we agree with and the friends that we talk to are the ones that live in our same little echo chamber. And so we're not used to getting dissenting opinions. Uh, I, I often use the example that, you know, if you were an American in the 1980s, uh, your choices for news were ABC, CBS, and NBC. And you could agree with the news or disagree with the news, but when you leaned over your fence to talk to your neighbor, you at least both got the same story and the same coverage. Mm -hmm. And so there was that common ground from which you could depart and have civil discourse. The problem now is with so many choices that there is no common ground. You're gonna see entirely different stories, entirely different co coverage. And so there's no common ground from which to disagree from. And that makes public discourse very, very difficult. If I can interrupt and, and jump, I saw a really, really great Rand Waltzman posted uh, something just a few minutes ago um, where she she's I mean, it's worth mentioning, right? Um, Sidney Powell, who, uh, you know, it's on the record publicly that she uh, provided her defense that the, the kinds of things that she was offering up as evidence and her case and whatnot, which let's let's face it, a lot of resources, a lot of time and energy went into all of that. Her, you know, the crux of her defense is reasonable people would not have believed it. You know, and that that is an important thing to consider right now is that uh, uh, we we live in an era where um, there what what you know what we've been talking about is this confusing environment, but there are people who see opportunity in that environment and they'll take deliberate actions to push people in certain directions. They're looking to accomplish a, a certain agenda of their own, be they Russian actors or profiteers or whatever the case may be. Um, it, it's very evident to me with a statement like that, that you, you have to pay great notice to the fact that there are these there are these actors and agents that are looking to do something with your uh, with with your mindset, your thinking, your choices. Right? You are a target. Well, and I, what I really like about what that shows too is, like you said, I mean, in any environment with any solution, people will find ways to exploit, it. and it doesn't even have to be high tech. Um, one of our audience members pointed out. You know, with the with the Pelosi video, it was just slowed down. It wasn't even a deep fake. And so sometimes the 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 most rudimentary of tech can actually cause a disruption. Uh, we also know there's a there was a performance artist who pointed out that if you put cell phones uh, on a skateboard and you carry them slowly down the street, you can fool um, Google's algorithm into thinking there's a traffic jam. And that's not high tech to do either. It's not like you compromise any system. You just fooled it. Uh, and then lastly, I am waiting for the day in which some attorney is going to use the, 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 the defense that my client was rendered um, uh, unable to make decisions on the basis of uh, algorithm. So, so insanity by algorithm, I look forward to and that that actually can be claimed, but uh, we'll see if that happens. But um, so now we're at the lightning round and, and we're going to now circle back and we're actually going to sort of close with uh, what should we do about this? And so I'm going to go to you, SJ, first looking for two to three tweet links recommendations, whether it's for public sector leaders, private CAOs, members of the public directly, what would you recommend as calls to action in this space as part of the lightning round? Well, one is to move up a level. So you want to disrupt the intentions of the people creating these things. You want to counter in a space that's above the artifact, above you know, the accounts messages level. At least go to narrative level, if not higher. Um, second part, is look to where the action is shifting. So bots still exist. 
but we've got to shift towards networks of real accounts, fake groups with the real people, the cyborgs. What's coming next after that on mass section? Find that. Start countering ahead of that. Very well said, exactly. And I think this points to it would really be great if we we, we later had an actual Atlantic Council endeavor and maybe we can make it a whole council endeavor involve some of our fellows and members and other centers. What is coming next? I mean, recognizing that, you know, the best way to, to predict the future is to create it. If, like you said, if we can get ahead of where things might be going, uh, where are the things that in particular we don't want to have happen so we can actually try and steer into things that if it still happens, is less in mind. Go ahead, SJ. We've got lessons from InfoSec on that. Go look at MLSEC. Ah, so That's you've already... A it's going ahead. Yeah, uh, we've, we've been there for a few years now. Perfect. And we'll make sure to include a, a link also at, in the update for this. When we update the video for this talk, we can also include a link if there's any references you have there too. All right, I'd now like to go to Alex. Alex, what would you recommend as two to three action steps for, for leaders in this space? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it all has to kind of culminate in what in my mind is some kind of a commission that looks to declare the desired end state that we really need to get to. What are we really looking to achieve for your experience out in the information space? And then underneath that stuff, the details include recognizing kind of the, the functional and technical problems like we talked about before, the, the race condition that you need to get to the information space first with the good stuff so that you're not having to show up in second place and fight disinformation, for example. The sheer volume of information that's out there, how do you combat that with greater volumes of what you want out there, the persistent engagement in that space. I think if you have those things and then you stood up, say, for example, what we used to have until the late 90s, the U.S. Information Agency or some kind of cabinet level position that could help forward, you know, and like align the gears of government, you could actually take action from a policy standpoint. And then you could figure out how technology um, fits in and underpins an approach to all of that moving forward. Well said, and I really appreciate that you said that there are some things from the past that we can bring there. However, the first thing we need to do is figure out what's the end state we're aiming for, and then from there, galvanize our actions to that. All right, Pablo, uh, bring it home for us. What would be your two to three action steps that you would recommend that we do in this space? Sure. For authoritative sources, I would say get people used to going to your site as the authoritative source and proactively put out good information. Uh, for journalists, Label very well what's commentary, what's reporting, and then show your work. Give me your references that you're reporting on. I understand that's not always possible with confidential sources, but I think we could do that better. For uh, consumers, go to news sources that make you uncomfortable. Don't allow yourself to be stuck in your own echo chamber. And then this one is critical. We've gotten away from this civil discourse. We cannot have a successful democracy without civil discourse. On the last one, let me see if I can put a positive spin on this. Let's see if we can incentivize social media to help us fix this problem. Uh, Very well said. And that's a, that's a nice positive spin on that. And maybe, SJ, if I can go to you for one last bonus round, since you are you're coming to us from Europe. Imagine you were prime minister for the day or, or whatever role is appropriate. If we were to try and encourage some transatlantic conversation on this, so it's not just the US trying to solve it for the US and it's not just Europe trying to solve it on Europe, um, what would you recommend in this space? Actually, that's still sort of white majority country speaking English. Uh, so we, need to, we need to broaden the audience. <laughs> um, so I've been working with the UNDP. I'm about tomorrow to start working WHO across different areas. Um, this is a world problem. Yes. So what we so what so is it? Do we do it through the UN? Is the UN going to be the effective forum? Um, what would be the right places to make sure we do have a diverse set of voices, as you said, as a as a truly truly global uh, challenge here? I think you need those voices at the table. There are some very good disinformation groups um, around the world. I, I've been working with some excellent ones down in Africa. Um, Africa being not being the country, but the place <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. I would bring the UN groups because they connect a lot of those up, but I would also look to regional as well. Mm -hmm. So what's happening regionally that we don't understand? I mean, this still, it's, it's another area that's ripe for reverse innovation. Um, like people in Nigeria have been used to dealing with this for a long time. Um, Kenya, that disinformation didn't just suddenly appear it was already pretty rife in a lot of countries and people right. worked ways around it. Listen to them too. 
Very good point. Well, I look forward to maybe that can be a future episode that we do, like you said, elevate the voices that we that have been dealing with this maybe in a in a different context and how can we actually have that inform the lessons here in digital. I want to thank Alex. I want to thank Pablo. I want to thank SJ as always. You all are impressive global change agents and you're definitely doing a lot of good in this space. Thanks for joining us for a really engaging conversation. I would invite our audience to join us again next Wednesday for part two of this conversation on what we can do in these interesting, challenging issues. With that, as always at the Atlantic Council, we encourage you to please be bold, please be brave, and please be benevolent for the future ahead. Thank you. <laughs>